Hello, everybody. Hmm. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs> Hear us, Steve, you can do your thing. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. This, this afternoon here in Hawaii, I thought uh, I would offer a transmission of the Brahma Viharas, some description of them and some practice as well. Brahma, uh, meaning sublime or divine, and Vihara, meaning uh, dwelling or abode. Uh, we can think of the Brahma Viharas as, as the, the home of the heart, where lives unconditional loving kindness, uh, the care of compassion, the, the delight or appreciative joy of uh, mudita and the uh, serenity and peace of upeka equanimity when we first come across the brahma viharas it might seem a little far to the reach uh, um, but once we start practicing them they become more familiar and those moments where we're free of anxiety or stress, <clears throat> agitation, suddenly one of them is there. We feel kindness um, as, as part of the heart or someone, some being we know who's injured. We just feel this, this native sense of care and wish to alleviate their pain, their suffering. And even if we were not feeling joy ourselves, when we see someone's happiness or fulfillment, creativity, or connect with their goodness, suddenly there's this rush of appreciation or empathetic joy in the heart. And when none of those other conditions are there, we might still feel this steady, equanimous kind of love or kindness, just no matter what, just looking out on a beautiful day or at a flower or contemplating the well-being of a friend. No particular reason or no particular object, but there it is, this, this even-minded, warmth that is the definition of equanimity to look upon to look over as opposed to looking away these practices were around before the time of the buddha other traditions took them up some even called them the um the end of practice they mistook them for liberation, but there was still always at least the potential for identifying with them, you know, self-referencing that the quality that's being developed is my unconditional love or my great compassion, my joy, and so forth. So as the Buddha often did with existing practices, once his awakening occurred, he, he did his best not to go against the grain by incorporating as much as he could under this, under this experience of awakening. He didn't create a new belief system, a new religion, uh, some new path of practice. It actually developed in the days following 
uh, his own awakening. So he took what was useful. And for the Brahma Viharas, for example, the, these divine abidings, uh, they're also called Apramana, which means the, the four immeasurables. He simply infused them with the wisdom of his awakening, the selflessness, the understanding of the anicca nature, impermanent nature, and dukkha nature, the unreliability or uh, unsatisfactoriness of what is continually disappearing, the transient nature of things. And thirdly, the anatta nature, the uncontrollability uh, and selfless nature, emptiness of self in all beings and all phenomena. So, he, so, so too, he did this with the uh, Brahma Viharas themselves, infusing love with this uh, selfless understanding and wisdom and the great care of compassion, making it um, a fearless compassion. Fearless in what sense? Being unafraid of someone's suffering. You know, being able to walk into a room, for example, where someone might be taking their last, last breaths or picking up an injured child, perhaps your own, um, but unafraid of the injury, of the pain, physical or psychological, emotional. Being able to step in the midst of that, of that dukkha, that discomfort, distress, and just care. And as we begin to discover, it's not so much what we do or say or, uh, because sometimes no matter what we do or what we say, um, it doesn't seem at the time at least to alleviate the suffering. But the mere composure of, and presence of compassion of this fearless kind of care that, that's not afraid of the suffering and is, is willing to be there and just have that uh, compassionate presence. That is often the most palpable and transformative quality we can bring to a situation where there is dukkha, where there is any kind of suffering. And with the mudita or empathetic joy, its selfless nature is in the ability to take joy in someone else's happiness without needing any of it for ourselves, without the, that near enemy of wanting some piece of that, some part of that, but to genuinely de delight and appreciate that that person is feeling at that time, uh, that moment, a fulfillment, a wholeness, or we attune to the goodness of another being. And that alone is the, the cause for our feeling this delight, joy, in their happiness, in their goodness, in their fulfillment, in their creativity. And sometimes it's a situation where None of these first three very pleasant qualities of, of loving kindness and uh, caring, compassion, uh, empathetic joy are particularly called for, or even if we call them up, it seems to have no immediate affect on the situation. And the, the only last resort is to just settle into the moment and realizing that the conditions are such that there is no control ultimately that we have in sustaining someone's happiness or removing someone's suffering. That it's just that way, at least in, at that moment. And so that that deeper stability and serenity of allowing for that experience 
that we have no control of to be there. So we could call that more of an equanimous love and care that we're present for it, we're witnessing it, we're not turning away from it. The definition of upeka is to look upon or to look over, uh, like a caring presence. Uh, and care and kindness uh, and joy are never far away. The Brahma Viharas are of one nature, one heart, one mind. Uh, the one, or the quality, the facet that's most called for is what steps forward. So on many occasions, and the last year or so is one of them, uh, this upeka or equanimous stream of heart, flow of mind is what's most useful to us perhaps in combination with compassion. And in our own close home lives, still there's the expressions of kindness and love and, and joy and delight. As we develop our practice and peel off those layers of attachment and fear, aversion, delusion, we find that uh, integral to the heart, to the uh, neurological and psychological level and physicality of our being is where these Brahma Viharas actually live. They're, they're not constructions in the first place. They're, in, they're like an instinctual, instinctual level of our being. We take off the wrappings, we take off the cover, uh, all our defenses of attachment and and fear, <clears throat> aversion, and so forth. And what remains is this tender heartedness, this caring quality of our uh, innermost nature. So that we quite naturally respond to conditions. We don't have to, in those moments, we often see we don't have to call up a particular Brahma Vihara. We often suggest it like before sitting, for example, so that our, our mindful approach to experience is, is um, infused with kindness or infused with compassion or a joyous awareness or an equanimous mindfulness and so forth because it's helpful to practice them. Even if these qualities are innate to our being, they're at least underdeveloped before we come to this practice. And um, as we know, anything we, we are passionate about, anything we love, in one form or another, we practice it. We do it repeatedly. We become good at it, become skilled at it whether it's carving or painting or sculpting, uh, whatever it is we do, it's the, it's the um, patient uh, repetition of doing a thing over and over again until it's refined that brings it to its purest nature. It's the same with the Brahma Viharas. We were, we were, young practitioners and many of us had done quite some year, many years of of uh, vipassana insight practice before we had the kind of training that that some of us had for example with uh, the the burmese sangha monastics uh, such as upandita who gave us a practice where we would concentrate one at a time on each of the Brahma Viharas to bring them to their essence nature, to bring them into their uh, most fulfilled and refined, uh, beautiful state. The, the practice as a whole um, is, is to bring out the, the beautiful heart, the beautiful mind the Pali term bhavana uh, means, means the cultivation of the beautiful heart, uh, beautiful states of mind. These 
these are four of them. These Brahmaviharas are four of them. So when we did intensive meditation practice with the Brahmaviharas, following those practices, they were just more accessible on a daily basis. You know, perhaps 10 minutes before a, an insight Vipassana session, we would do one or more of the Brahma Viharas, or maybe the last 10 minutes, we practice the Brahma Vihara. Or in walking meditation, as we had trained with Upandita, we would do a Brahma Vihara session of to and fro walking. So rather, for example, rather than pay close attention to the, uh, the intricacies of, of movement in the walking to and fro, we would just walk to and fro, let go the, the, that attunement to the sort of microbiology of movement and hold our Brahmavihara subject whoever it is we were sending metta to, ourselves, an easy person, or all beings. Uh, likewise with a compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. For hours and hours every day, until it was quite ingrained. And then following the retreat, it would be more accessible in our daily practice, but also when we weren't doing formal practice we might suddenly become aware of a challenging interaction uh, with a friend or a relative or anywhere going about our daily business and suddenly be aware of that. Just catch that. And just with a mind moment, with a powerful intention, which is ultimately where these Brahma Viharas settle and find their greatest potency, that is the intention to be kind the intention to care, the intention to be appreciative wherever we see happiness, and the intention to have an even-mindedness with regard to experience. In that very moment of, of correcting error, where we felt challenged and maybe we're about to say something out of agitation, reactively, it would just shift into one of those Brahma Viharas there might not even be a moment there to choose which one. Sometimes there is. We take a, a figuratively, we take a step backward and call up whatever comes to mind, metta or um, equanimity. But more often than not, because we've been practicing this, by nature, by instinct, we might just find suddenly when we're in this challenging moment about to be reactive and to say something we don't want to say, suddenly the intention shifts to be kind, to be compassionate, period. Maybe to the person we're challenged by, but maybe just to ourselves, or maybe just to energetically kind of put it out. So we're living in this atmosphere where we're breathing in kindness and compassion. It doesn't matter. But once that in, in Brahma Vihara intention is activated, it's there. All the Brahma Viharas are there. And whichever one might be most helpful and useful in the moment, it's going to manifest. And it's going to change the atmosphere, change the flavor, change the tone of the voice, what, what words we speak, and the quality of the connection to the other, whatever, whatever being we may be engaged with, or our own mind state. The Buddha, the Buddha said about the Brahma Viharas that that they, the Brahma Vihara practices, uh, can be the pathway to liberation. That is, we can take up Brahma Viharas as a primary mode of, of quality practice, transformational practice, uh, while still having the aim and goal of liberation through insight. 
that the Brahma Viharas provide the stepping stones. So in the years following our Brahma Vihara practice, practice training with Upandita, I remember many discussions we, I had with him personally about these practices and the importance of them, particularly for Western culture, modern culture. He was a strong kind of warrior approach to insight practice, you know, direct liberation practice, just to sit, look at the truth of this body and this mind, moment to moment experience and, until there's degrees of awakening, up to full awakening. And we found that so many of us in Western culture were injured in ways that in the beginning only kindness spoke to us. Only compassion uh, was meaningful. And feeling some semblance of, of joyous delight was like food, nurture to our being. Uh, and through many discussions, he began to understand and while I was actually training with him and could have discussions after watching the interaction between Upandita and a student, after they would leave and I would say, point something out, I saw that he understood and, uh, and I felt his uh, affirming of the importance of Brahma Vihara practice, of the, of the immeasurable practices uh, as an offering that he was trying to bargain for well maybe later on in the insight you know after some years of insight practice or some degree of progress in insight practice i said no it has to be now it has to be from the beginning it has to be so many of us can take the very next steps uh, to to feel enough of that unconditional love to feel worthy to walk toward liberation on the path of insight, to feel enough care and compassion for ourselves or others, to be able to take further steps along the way, enough joy to feel energized by that joy, to take up sometimes what's very difficult and challenging and uh, intimidating in insight practice when we look at our mind, when we look at our lives. Uh, areas of, of lack, areas of injury, areas in our being of uh, intrusion, invasion from long ago before memory, from pre-verbal times. And because these practices, mindfulness and all the Brahma Viharas are, are ultimately on the pre-verbal level, even when we begin conceptually, ultimately the quality of the Brahma Vihara, the immeasurable itself, like mindfulness, is a non-conceptual or pre-conceptual, pre-verbal quality. And therefore, it can enter into those deep dungeons, dungeons of the mind where there has been intrusion and injury and, and where it feels like some part of us was stolen or you know, left empty, left bereft. Enter now uh, awareness or awareness and kindness, awareness and care and awareness and joy awareness and serenity, peace. And then we have a practice. We have a full bodied, meaningful practice. I was happy with the years of conversation with Upandita uh, when he died a few years ago at 95. Um, two of us flew to, his, uh, to Burma, to his funeral like the next day and in the days I was there and paying my respects 
as he lay in his glass coffin, I, I thanked him. I thanked him for listening. I thanked him for seeing us and understanding us. It was new to him. It was a challenge to him to work with the first Westerners who came to the Mahasi Center in Rangoon all those decades ago. And then when, when he came to the West here in Hawaii and mainland America uh, to che teach these challenging young rascals, <laughs> as he sometimes regarded us. <laughs> uh, some of us uh, giving him a good challenge and speaking our minds. He actually really liked that. So I thank him on behalf of, of all of us and the lineages that were left behind, Vipassana and the Brahma Viharas. I'm going to switch to a story, and, and then we'll do some practice. It's a, a story of how I see love and kindness, compassion, uh, as stepping, stepping stones to connecting with one's goodness, to connecting um, with a spiritual mentor in friendliness uh, in order to see the truth, in order to have the vision of the nature of things as they are. The Jataka tale I hadn't told for a long time. Jataka number 476. Many years ago in New Zealand, I did a month retreat uh, on the land of one of our students who um, built a retreat center in nine months after his first retreat with Michelle and I at a Tibetan center on the North Island. Um, and he also built several cabins about 40 minutes away, one and an hour away, a second one and two hours away where a Tibetan um, monk did a two-year retreat, a three-year retreat, actually, at some point. So I'd often go there and do a self-retreat. And for this particular month, I had the three volumes of the Buddhist Jataka tales, birth stories. There was 547 of them. And uh, every day at at, from three to six, I would, re, I would study them and read them and retranslate them in my mind as many of them were written at the turn of the 19th century. So the language was Victorian, not particularly acceptable to us today. So I kind of lived through the essence of the, each story and, and then just would sit sit with that and feel it inside. So in this, in this Jataka tale, birth story tale, the Buddha was born as a, as a goose, as a special goose, swift goose. It's called the swift goose. Uh, at the same time, it was during the time of uh, the king of Banaras, Brahmadatta was his name at the time. And the, the great goose, we'll call him the great being, was living at Mount Chittakuta with 90,000 geese in his flock. And there they ate sweet wild rice and, and lived by next to a lake, deep, clear, soothing lake. And one day he was flying around Banaras, India, and he flew so fast, made like a big tapestry in the sky, so fast, it's like a woven fabric. And the king of Banaras, Brahmadatta, looked up and saw that and asked his courtiers, well, what's that? And they told him that, oh, that's this, this, this goose who lives in the mountains. 
and the king said, well, could you please send him, you know, um, incense and gifts and unguents. I particularly like the unguents. <laughs> and uh, so they did. They ordered the incense and little gifts, sweets, wild rice and unguents. <clears throat> and they carried it up to uh, the Mount Chittakuta, to the lake where the goose and his flock lived. And the great being said to his uh, ministers, why is the king, of, why is that human king from Benares doing this? And they said, he wants to be friends. And so the great being said, okay, let us be friends then. And time went on and the, the king heard that and every day he, he looked out, hoping to see his friend come, and didn't come, but he was down by his, uh, his park, his garden park, one day when the great bean showed up. And they had a, a sweet, and kind interchange conversation uh, about the life they each led, the human life and the goose life. And at that time, the great being felt, this is a good person. I can see his goodness. I like him. And he went back to uh, his mountain lake place. And one morning, the, the two of the young geese uh, were challenging each other to fly as fast as their leader, the great goose. And so they went to the great goose and said, we want, to, we want to race against the sun. And the great goose said, oh, oh no. The sun is very, very fast. You won't be able to keep up with the speed of the sun. You will both perish. And they asked again. And then finally, the pro proverbial third ask. But still, in this case, the proverbial third ask didn't matter. The Buddha still, I mean, the great being still said, no, <laughs> no, I'm warning you, you can't do it. But the next morning, those two young geese were uh, on Mount Yugnaga, ready to take off when the sun hit the horizon. And the great being, when he woke, he, he scanned his 90,000 and noticed the two were missing. So he immediately knew where they were, and he also went up to uh, Mount Yugananda and was there beside the two young geese. And when the sun came up over the horizon and struck the top of the mountain, the three of them set off to race the sun. Long about forenoon, the younger one began to have burning in his wings and saying, oh, great being, I can't do this any further. I'm faltering. My wings feel like fire. I'm going to perish. And the great being soothed him, took him on his wing, said, do not worry. You will be okay. And soothing him with metta, brought him back to the safety of the flock, put him into the lake so he could cool his burning wing. And then in two moments caught up with the other one who went on past noon. But finally, he too, his, his wing was burning. Uh, said, the great being, my, my wing is burning and I feel I'm, um, I'm falling and I will perish, as you said. I'm not going to make it. And the great being also took him on his wing, and took him back, and soothed him with metta. And then when they were safe, he himself, the great being himself, raced against the sun, forward, behind it, you know, all around it, doing spinners and circles and tricks and all of that until he said to himself, this is folly. This is foolish. Why am I doing this? I'm going to visit my, fr my friend and, and transmit truth, Dhamma. So then he appeared at the 
window of the king of Benares and said, great king, I am here. And the king was so delighted and brought him in and set him on a golden chair and served him uh, sweet rice and water in a golden chalice. <laughs> and said, what has your day been like? <laughs> and the great being told him about the young geese and the uh, flying against the speed of the sun. And, and then the great being then started to kind of settle down, relax. And the king of Benares, Brahmadatta, said, you know, I noticed your, your flight back here. Before you came back, I noticed this huge blanket over Benares, which is 12 leagues long by 12 leagues wide. Was that you? And the great being said, yes. Yes, I was flying over Benares on my way back from the sun. And I had been flying so fast, I, I had to slow down. So at first, it seemed like a great solid blanket with no light coming through, no cracks or crevices. But then before I came to your windowsill, I began to slow down. And you must have seen seams of light come through. And then it all disappeared. Yeah, that was me flying so fast. It gave the illusion of that covering, a shade for Benares. And so the King Brahmadatta said, we are both kings. You, you're a king of a great flock of geese. and I'm king of humans here in Benares. Can you show me your speed against the sun? And the great being said, no, I can't show you such speed. And Brahmadatta said, well, can you show me something like it? Yes, great king, I can show you something like it. So he asked the king to produce four greatest archers and a column in the field, in the courtyard, and a bell. Uh, and then they repaired down to the courtyard and the, the great goose had the bell put around his neck and stood on the pillar and the four great archers uh, facing the four cardinal directions. And the great being said, Brahmadatta, on my signal, the archers will fire their arrows in the four directions. The arrows won't land and you won't see me leave. You will just hear the bell tingle. And so the signal was given and in an instant, uh, the arrows were fired and in the same instant, they were at the feet of the archers who fired them and only the bell tingled. There was no one who could see the swiftness of the goose, retrieve them and lay them at the feet of the archers. And with that, the king of Benares, Brahmadatta, said, that's fast. And he fainted. <laughs> he passed out. <laughs> and his courtiers had to revive him with smelling salts and ammonia and <laughs> give him water, bring him back to consciousness. <coughs> and when he came back to consciousness, he said, great being, that was fast. And the great being said, actually was slower than the slowest of my slowest speeds. And the king passed out again. <laughs> And he had to be brought to again, it's really overwhelming to him. And looking at the great being, the great goose for explanation, he said, um, faster than the fastest of my speeds 
is the speed with which all phenomena appear and vanish moment to moment. The transient nature of every element of being, physical, mental, emotional, what you see, what you hear, all experience, all experienceable, experienceable phenomena, the speed with which they arise and pass. Imperceptible, not the fastest of my fastest speed can show you that. And, and that was sobering. The king did not pass out a third time. It woke him up with interest to feel that truth. And then the res his response was kindness. Can you stay here with me and be my teacher, my mentor, oh great being? I have my flock to tend to, 90,000, and you have your um, people to look after. And they need your generosity. They need your compassion. They need your kindness and warmth. They need your care. Will you come back and teach me more? Should everything be okay around Mount Chittakuta? Um, once in a while, I will pay you a visit and offer you more teachings, my friend, my good friend. In the meantime, when there are friends such as you and me, distance and space disappear. It is as if I am here. I've shown you my friendship. I've also shown you the truth of nature, of impermanence, of dukkha, of anatta. Through this truth, you will find I am never far away. And two friends who love like this are, are not apart, though we be thousands of miles in geography, separated. And thus the great being gave his teaching, went back to his flock, and the king indeed carried on uh, with an uplifted spirit of generosity, uh, kindness, compassion, and now a knowledge of the truth that led him toward more and more progress of insight and toward awakening. Now I'd like you to notice what's happening in, in your bodies, what you notice, how the body is behaving, what sensations you notice perhaps particularly around the heart center. Hearing these words of care and compassion and how through the stepping stones of care and compassion and generosity, one can awaken more to true nature, impermanence, imperfection, impersonality. In the practice of the Brahma Viharas, often one starts with a, an easy Brahma Vihara subject, like an easy person to love or an easy person who's suffering that we care for without conditions, without fear. An uh, easy person to feel joy rather than envy or jealousy for their happiness, success, fulfillment. But choose a Brahma Vihara that is readily available that might already be resting in your heart or as your heart. Alongside of them always is the great equalizer of even-minded upeka. Uh, 
equanimity that balances and thus purifies the pleasant qualities of kindness, care, joyous appreciation. We don't always need a Brahma Vihara uh, easy subject. If it's just there, then abide in it and from the heart, let it fill the body. Let it fill, fill our emotional, mental body, psychological body. And let it easily go out to our gathered Sangha community here, touching each and every one of us, all of us supporting the other through our practice, through our devotion, sincerity, and the spirit of again and again calling up awareness, calling up these Im immeasurables, Brahma Viharas. Simply arresting, uh, resting within the Brahma Viharas, that abiding is one at the same time extending. Abiding is the radiating. We don't have to do anything. If we abide in a moment of kindness, then kindness is everywhere. Can you experience that? Abiding in compassion, it immediately goes everywhere in all directions. Everywhere at once, as swift as the great goose, swift goose. And abiding in joy, that joyous appreciation extends everywhere. Abiding in the mental equipoise of equanimity is, is being peace, being serenity and stability. And that affects all, all beings everywhere. See for yourself.
I'll take a moment if there's any specific questions about the Brahma Vihara practice that would be helpful to you. I think most of you have done the practices before with us at retreats. Um, Just to complete what I suggested in the talk, in terms of times of practice, you can do a whole Brahma Vihara sitting, or you can begin of a pasana practice with say 10 minutes or so of one of the Brahma Viharas and then end again with one of the Brahma Viharas. You can do walking practice to and fro or the same 20 steps or so you might do with a Vipassana at any speed that supports you holding the Brahma Vihara in mind. Um, the conceptual practice is to, to hold, for example, an easy metta subject. And you hold them in, in your heart or in mind as you walk to and fro, the same way you would if you were sitting. Um, You can do, in the walking, you can, if you're familiar with the Brahma Vihara practice, you can do a single Brahma Vihara, or you can do a few points of A to B and back to A with one Brahma Vihara, and then call up another if you wish. Just that they're all practiced, you all feel them getting getting practiced well and see which ones uh, become prominent, sparked to life for you. Others may feel a little flatter at times. It's okay. You don't have to take it as a project. Another time, another day, another situation, and maybe that, that particular Brahma Vihara will come up. Remember that practicing any one of them is the same as practicing all four of the immeasurables. So sitting exclusively with a Brahma Vihara or in preceding or at the end of a Vipassana sit, one of your walking sessions, Brahma Vihara. What I do recommend is that you, you have a schedule that you plan ahead so that there's, there's no doubt. You don't kind of flip-flop, should I do this or I do that according to what's coming up. When we set our intention to sit, for example, with awareness, with, our, with whatever comes up, it's usually, what comes up is usually exactly what we need to investigate with mindfulness or with what comes up is usually exactly what we need to feel if we're doing a Brahma Vihara. So we don't want to kind of back away uh, and and try to change the formula then. What comes up is because we set the intention. As you recall in the talk, I I said the the strongest, purest, most potent Brahma Viharas are on the intention level. That's what sets them in our neurology, in our biology, in our psychology. So it's good to, and that way we do a schedule ahead of time, 10 minute Brahma Vihara, and then the rest of the Vipassana practice are 10 at the beginning, 10 at the end. And then one of the walkings, like you can change the schedule, but if you have one schedule for the day, that's, it's good to stick to it. Then what we experience is likely exactly what we need to experience, no matter what. Any questions about that or anything else to do with the Brahma Viharas?
You all know how to do the little blue hand, right? <laughs> okay. Actually, I don't. Quinn, you have a blue hand. Uh, you have to unmute. No, you don't. I'm, I'm unmute. Okay. You're not. Can you're you not hear muted. me? Yes. Okay. Um, your story about uh, Upandita um, brought me to tears when you talk about paying respect and gratitude at his death. Uh, I felt that um, you learn the lessons from him and that now you are carrying the torch and you are imparting your knowledge to us. And uh, I just felt so emotional about that. Uh, that we are just uh, holding on the lineage. So I want to thank you for that and thank Upandita too. Thank, thank you, Quinn. It's your all, lineage now. All my teachers. Mm. About the Brahma Viharas, mm. for years uh, I, I just treasure uh, loving kindness and uh, compassion so much. Uh, I felt like my heart was like the desert soil that soaping up uh, loving kindness and compassion and it was very healing for me. Uh, but now I feel that um, what I need is sympathetic joy. Um, a few months ago, I came upon this article, a, a very ordinary article in the newspaper about the uh, high school graduates in Hawaii. And there was a sentence that struck a chord in me that said, um, all the high school graduates, whatever you achieve, us, the people of Hawaii, we are proud of your achievement because that's also our achievement. And it's something very ordinary, but somehow I felt, yes, you know, uh, whatever buddy's joy is, that's my joy too. Why not? We're not going to diminish somebody's joy because we're just, sharing in and um in these times when it's everything is so bleak and so challenging i felt i needed sympathetic joy more than ever uh i i i have to look for other people's achievements whatever good and wholesome in everybody i i dip you know my heart in in the that fountain of joy uh, and uh that's what's helping me in these moments. And everyone is benefiting from that, Quinn. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So you have the practices. Please carry on for the benefit of all, all beings everywhere. 